draw us in, to make room in your presence for us. For we are yours, and you love us dearly. So we ask, O oh Lord, that as we gather together in your name, as we open our hearts and our minds to you, we pray that you would lead us, that you would speak to us, that you would form in us that which you would desire. For we are yours, and we thank you that you will never let us go. So we say, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As I said earlier, it is wonderful to be with you. My wife is here with me, uh, Laura Lee, and we're delighted to be able to spend the morning together. It's, it's terrific to be here. I'm so pleased that uh, both Father Tim Shaw as well as Deacon John Gullick have been extending their leadership in this place. I hope it feels to you like a breath of fresh air. And uh, in fact, I, when I, we were back in the sacristy, John said something to me. I said, feels different. And he said, yeah, it's a happy place. And I'm, I'm more than glad to hear that. Why, why am I more than glad to hear that? Not just because people are trying to find a way to get along. But if, if we are believing Christians, a part of what should mark our relationships with each other is that we do get along. We learn how to forgive. We learn how to trust. We learn how to find a way to do things together. We're finding ways to enjoy each other's company. And to be a place, be in essence, a kind of community that genuinely cares about each other, has each other's back. And as such, we become, as that kind of caring community, a witness to Auburndale and beyond, that this is a group of church people, imagine that, church people, that actually like each other. And, and that it is, in fact, the fruit of something that God is doing. You see, our call, our task, as it were, as a congregation of people, is in some small way, in the midst of our profound humanity and our failures and all that make us the kind of corrupt people that we really are inside. That's true for us, isn't it? You know, Nobody's off that mark. That God is doing something inside of us that actually reflects himself. In other words, we by virtue of that kind of care, that kind of forgiveness, that kind of loyalty, that kind of compassion, are actually reflecting the very work of God. You, you see, left to our own devices, what we would do is basically just take care of ourselves. And you know, if you have a need and I get put out, well then I'm sorry, I can't help you. You're on your own. Have a nice life. That, that's kind of how much of the world operates. We are becoming, as a society, actually increasingly private. We're the only people that we hang out with are people who look, talk, think, and act just like we do. And if we have a disagreement, then what happens is, well, we just go find a group of people that are going to agree with us. The problem with that, of course, is that it gets to be a smaller and a smaller circle. Because nobody ever agrees with us entirely, even though we wish somehow that that were true. Except I would want to tell you, if I was with a group of people that agreed with me all the time, it would actually feel pretty boring. Why does that reflect God to reflect that kind of loyalty, that kind of care, that kind of mutual commitment, that kind of compassion? Well, for two reasons. First of all, that's what we see in Jesus. Jesus didn't hightail it and run, but things got difficult. It says in John, having loved his own to the world, in the world, he loved them to the end. He was unswerving in his commitment to them. But why was that true? Because you see, that's actually the very nature of God. For God so loved the world, as it says in the Gospel reading today, that he gave his only Son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but rather that the world through him might be saved. When we have that kind of care and compassion, loyalty and commitment to one another, we reflect in a very small way the kind of loyalty, the kind of care, and the kind of compassion that God has demonstrated to us in his son Jesus. And if we have said yes to him, if we are one of those people that it says, whosoever believes, not only are we making that commitment because those are the standards by which we're trying to live, but actually that's something that God has worked in us. We have received from him his loyalty, his compassion, his commitment, his forgiveness toward us. We are, in other words, the recipient of all that he gives us. And it is such a radical change from our me-first nature that Jesus literally describes it as being born from above. In other words, it has to be something brand new that is worked inside the very essence of our being because otherwise we would only live out our very natural tendencies to be completely self-centered with short-lived relationships, loyalties with only with people who agree with us, and literally be kind of hostile when people don't. Have you ever met people like that? They're always nice until you cross them and then, whoa, whoa, watch out. The glory of it is that, you see, that's not how Jesus is. That is not compassion. I mean, one of the reasons we have the confession almost every Sunday is because we need, we need it. We need to be able to go to God and in a very formal way lay out all that's inside of us, good, bad, and indifferent, and especially the bad, and ask God's forgiveness. And do you ever expect Father Tim, after the confession, to come up and say, you know, I've heard from God, he didn't want to forgive you this <laughs> No, of course not. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. I can count on the forgiveness of God. I can count on it. Not as, in essence, an excuse to continue in bad behavior, but just the opposite. Because I really want to do what's right, but know that in the depth of my soul, there will be times when I just don't. Some of which I know and some of which I don't know. I need to hear in a very regular and constant way the good news of God's mercies. Because that's what he shows toward us again and again and again. Because that, again, is the very nature of God. Even in the opening story from Isaiah, which is actually a kind of almost terrifying story, I mean, here's Isaiah. He is in the temple. He's worshiping. I mean, what he's doing is exactly what we were called to do in the 29th Psalm. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name. And that's why he's there. He is worshiping and honoring the mighty, majestic, and holy one. In the midst of all of that, what's happening, God's presence literally fills the place where he's sitting. It's visible as well as experiential. And in the midst of all of that, what is... What is Isaiah's response? Oh, I'm in for it now. <laughs> I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live in a people in the, of unclean lips. And yeah, what does God do? God doesn't go, yeah, you're right. <laughs> what are you doing here? Instead, what he does is that he literally sends an angel with a live coal from the very altar within heaven breaking into space and time, which is what angels have the capacity to do. You see, they, they have literally free reign between eternity and time. They can move in and out of those dimensions at will under the direction of God. And that's exactly what this angel does. So the angel comes breaking into the temple from the very depths of eternity, and he doesn't say, now, you don't deserve this. <laughs> Instead, what he does, of course, is that he actually puts the coal on Isaiah's lips, and is commissioned. Of course, all Isaiah can do is, here am I, send me. You couldn't exactly at that point go, I think you need to find somebody else. 
And you see, that's actually what happens when genuine love comes from God and begins to touch our hearts. It's not just a question of being grateful. It is that, of course. Who am I to deserve this? But in fact, the very nature of that kind of love is to be expressed in what we give away. God so loved the world, John says in the Gospel, where Jesus says, that he what? He gave. And that's why the Isaiah lesson and the John lesson are in some ways two sides of the same coin. That God is who he is, majestic, powerful, strong, holy. That's why we go, even in the Eucharist, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. And there are times when I've said that or sung it where a part of me really does shake a little bit. So I know that I'm in the midst of, as we break bread at this altar, as we are gathering here, eternity is invading time again. And we are encountering firsthand the very presence of God. And yet, at that moment, I also know that in the midst of that holy majesty, I am the recipient the recipient of God's deep and powerful never leave you or forsake you love. And that's what gets expressed, not in the live coal, but in the bread and wine. I can count on it just as much as I can count on God's forgiveness. God never, when I come and lay my hands before him, or you, as we gather at the rail to receive as baptized Christians, God never looks at any one of us and says, well, I don't think you're going to get Jesus this morning, just bread. No, it, it is his steadfast love. But notice what happens after we receive. We pray a prayer together that is all about saying, send us out into the world to do the work that you've given us to do. In other words, it's not just a reception. It is a commissioning. Because it is the very nature of the love that we have received for it not just to be bottled in, but to flow through us. And quite frankly, if you meet a cranky Christian, which we, which we all do, sometimes we are, more often than not, some of that crankiness has everything to do with denying the love that we have received and choosing to live for ourselves. And when all that stuff gets bottled up inside, we get cranky. And it's not just because we're cranky people. It's because we're living out of kilter with the very compassion and love that God has put in us in the first place. In other words, because we've been saying no to the giving opportunities, to care for other people, to be available for God's service, to be generous with our time and our talent and the money that the Lord has given us, what it does is it literally closes something off inside of ourselves. Because by our own self-centeredness, we are denying the very thing that is most precious in our lives. And that's Him, the Lord, who Himself is the generous, kind, wondrous, compassion, full of mercy, and all-powerful God, who is born from above something profound in us, so that we become that channel that He asks us. It's big stuff. This isn't little. This is enormous. So what if I were to sort of put all of that in a nutshell, what would I say? Number one, to work to acknowledge that who we are as baptized Christians, sons and daughters of God, means that first and foremost, like Isaiah, we are committed to a life that is under God's authority. To worship God is first and foremost an act of subservience. I am not in charge. I give up my right to be Lord of my life. You are the Holy One, and I'm not. So I yield. I yield. I am not in charge of my life. And to do so is to literally deny the very work of what God has put in my life that winds up making me incredibly self-centered, cranky and complain. That's the fruit of that kind of self-centered life. 
but it's also a life where we are invited into the sweetest of fellowship with God. You see, the glory of God is that we're invited into something that literally at its most um, powerful is collaborative, subservient, and yet collaborative. Where we're saying yes to a God who is not only flowing in us, undeserved that we are, but literally by the choices that we are making to serve him by kindness, generosity, and giving, it's flowing through us that the very life of the Trinity of God, which is in and of itself a life of perfect fellowship, is literally going through us, not just within us. We're invited into something that God is doing, and he chooses to use us by his mercy so that through us, lives get touched in a way that would never happen should we choose to live self-centered, cranky. We miss out. See, that's the, that's the tragedy. The cranky, self-centered Christian misses out on the wonder of being a vessel through whom God manifests His love and His grace. It's tender. It's glorious. It's sometimes really tough and difficult. It's hard to be compassionate to people who don't want to be compassionate back. But that's true for Jesus, you see. That's what he knew. And he invites us into the very same. So my question is, are you up for this? Are you willing to say yes to the God who saved you through the death and resurrection of his son? To be both recipients of his mercy. To allow that which has been birthed in you to flower, to come alive. And if so, what does that look like? That looks like you saying yes to service being open to how God might want to use you in the lives of other people. And to be a part of a collective adventure that's happening here at St. Albans in a way that literally tells the people in this community that this is a group of people, contrary to their nature, who are learning how to love each other, how to care for one another, how to watch each other's back, how to be there in the midst of difficulty and is more than willing to invite other people to be a part of this exciting adventure. Because God didn't just love us. God so loved the world. I think that's what these lessons are about. It's a commission. It's a receiving. It's saying yes. Subservient. But a vessel full of gratitude. So, in one short sentence, what am I saying? Real simple. Just keep saying yes. Put that on your refrigerator. <laughs> keep saying yes. And see what God will do, both in you and through you. Amen. Amen. Amen.